Brilliant. Fine. Many thanks indeed. Good to see you all. Um, one or two old friends in here and uh, one or two new. So let's get started. What we're talking about this morning is uh, we, we'll, we'll look at the charts um, before we finish today. Of course, we'll uh, look at the second half. But I uh, just want to uh, take a, a little wander through what has been going on with the uh, currency wars and some of the major sort of machinations that we've seen and what have been some of the effects and in particular a number of the unintended consequences that uh, follow through from playing around with uh, well, currency rates and, of course, interest rates through QE. Now, there's no such thing as a free lunch, and um, when um, something fairly major is created in the market, then um, it's those consequences of having to actually pay for what um, has, has been created that's where the pain can really come in. And we've certainly seen it um, in a good many areas. So let's just, just take a one, throw up one or two slides that um, I'd just like to set the scene with. First of all, it was, uh, it was Japan that really got things moving in the currency war. There we were. We had um, this weekly chart then of the U.S. dollar against the Japanese yen. So as the, as the U.S. dollar rises up, 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 then that implies that the other side of that currency, the Japanese yen, is just collapsing, moving on down. And we we saw that uh, the Japanese yen spent quite a bit of time in this region of around about sort of 76 to 80. And then it absolutely took off. And it took off just towards the end of last year. Then it surpassed the high, its previous high in um, 2013. And that was the trend established. And as you can see, it shot up really quite dramatically. So it's gone from 80 to 100, roughly. And uh, that move then is more than 10%, more than 20%. And it's not quite 25%. So there are a substantial move on up then for the US dollar against that Japanese yen. So um, what is um, what was the sort of the reasoning behind it all? Well, quite simply, the Japanese are in a bind. They're still in a bind. They were in a bind. They've been in a bind now for um, decades. And that bind is that um, they've got a moribund economy or at least the domestic economy in Japan, is just not moving. It's just stagnating along. There's, there's, there's no growth there. And um, they suffer from a, a number of things. Not only an enormous, a massive debt overhang from previous bubbles that they, uh, they, they managed to blow up quite nicely, and that they also suffer from a reduced amount of domestic consumption. They've got an aging population. And one of the most telling statistics that um, I was reading uh, some months ago was that the number of nappies, or the Americans would call them diapers, that were sold in Japan, um, if you split them between those that are sold for the incontinent aged and those that are sold for babies, they sell an awful lot more for the end continent aging. So they've got this big, big problem then that they've got an aging population and they haven't, they're not replacing their population. So they're gradually getting a reducing population and they need to import people. They need to increase their, their birth rate. Um, they need to do all sorts of major structural things to try and make a difference. Japan is different in that it's not a closed economy, it's exactly the opposite. In fact, they've got a very open economy in many ways. Um, They've got an economy which is trapped in many, many old ways, but they do a tremendous amount of um, overseas manufacturing, and that overseas manufacturing is both a good and a bad thing. So what are the effects then? As 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 a currency falls, then what, what do we get? We get um, imports just increase in price. 
And, ah, hold on, guys, I've got somebody who can't hear a thing. If you can hear me, can you just say yes or no, please? Fine. Okay, that's great. Yeah, fine. Excellent. Right. We're all on the, but that, that's a, that's a good question, actually. I, I really don't know if they do import nappies. Um, I imagine they've got some domestic, um, production, but they, they certainly do import a tremendous amount. So what is actually, one of the effects then of, of currency falling is that, um, imports actually become more expensive. And initially that's going to be inflationary until such time as the, uh, domestic uh, consuming public decide that all of those things and maybe just the nappies that they're buying are getting more expensive and they either just stop buying them or they will find a local substitute and then um, the the slightly longer term effect will be that inflation will drop. The other side of the um, import coin is exports and they become much more competitive. And that was one of the main reasons why the Japanese went down this route. They wanted to make their export more competitive to boost their own um, domestic production of exports. So those exporting um, com- companies, those manufacturing companies, they're actually based in Japan. They wanted it to boost them, and it has most certainly done that. Now, the downside, of course, is that competitive countries don't like it. And uh, there were, as you may remember, all those sort of G20 meetings, G8 and so on. And, um, you know, other countries are saying, now, look here, you know, we don't like this. We don't like the fact that you're now making our manufacturers more competitive. So by changing your currency, it's effectively a what they call a, a beggar my neighbor policy, because, you know, it's going to be good for Japan. But it's going to be bad for um, other markets, such as South Korea, particularly. Right. So hopefully I can uh, rejig the machine and uh, and here. So with Japan, of course, with this massive amount of sort of car manufacturing, particularly, and um, not just car manufacturing, of course, but that's the big one, which is carried out all around the world. I mean, it, it happens in America, or it happens um, in the UK, etc. And the earnings from those overseas manufacturers are boosted substantially. So as soon as they change their dollar income and their British pound income into yen, the difference is absolutely massive. And, of course, it will increase by that amount that the currency um, decides that it's going to uh, collapse by around about that sort of 20% mark. When eventually that money is repatriated into yen, then it's very, very useful for Japan and it can then become tax. The only problem, of course, is that companies don't like to pay tax. They don't like then to repatriate their earnings to be taxed on it. Because there are so many yen, the actual tax take in yen is going to also be increased. And consequently, you then get the Japanese authorities saying, oh, well, look, we'll, we'll give you a tax holiday, provided you repatriate some of this money. Right, so that's that little lot. But let's just look at the exact opposite that can happen with a currency that ends up strengthening. And... That's certainly been the effect of what has been going on with the pigs countries, these, those European countries, Portugal, um, Italy, Ireland, Greece, Spain, and so on. And what's effectively been happening there is that whilst their economies have been sort of collapsing on down, their currency, their euro, has just remain, been remaining incredibly strong, incredibly strong. So it's deflationary for them. That's number one. The exports that they attempt to export are going to be expensive and uncompetitive. And, of course, the net result of that is that they're not going to export much. 
they're going to export less and less and less. That is going to be deflationary for them. And, of course, you put those two things together where you've got imports sort of flooding in because they're sort of relatively cheap and exports are just no longer happening. The balance of payment is completely shot to pieces. So you end up then with more money leaving the country than comes in. And that's purely, purely, purely on the trade balance. As a result, then, of uh, lack of exports and so on, unemployment rises. And as a result of the unemployment rising, then the tax date take drops and the benefits payments rise. And so what do we find? Well, the government's in a bind because they've got less money coming in. They've got more money going out. And the only answer is to borrow more or get another bailout in the short run. In the long run, they've got to do all sorts of difficult things. And those difficult things are going to be making themselves more competitive. So they've got to become super efficient. And uh, we quite often hear the cry that, well, those European countries that have got a bit of a problem, what they've got to do, they've got to become more like Germany. They've got to become super efficient at their production, etc. But, you know, they are major structural changes. And those major structural changes do not happen overnight. Whereas currency effects can happen relatively overnight. Right, so what, what about QE? Now, we all, we all know about QE. We've, uh, we've, we've been living through it now for a good many years, actually since uh, 2008. And the effect has been just to reduce investment rates. We know that. In fact, we've been told by Ben Bernanke and we've been told by Mark Carney over here in the UK with their forward guidance that interest rates are going to remain low. They have decreed that they will remain low now for a number of years looking ahead, at least another three years. <laughs> and, Philip, you're absolutely spot on. QE, <laughs> low interest rates, um, causes all sorts of problems. It solves things such as not allowing banks to collapse and the collateral damage that there would be with those banks collapsing. And it just keeps things sort of bubbling along, rather like Japan has been bubbling along for the last two, three decades. But where is growth? So one of the effects then of QE is that the money that is produced has got to go somewhere. And that money wants to find a high yield. It cannot find it. It cannot find it at home. And so it chases yield wherever it can be found. So what tends to happen is that in the emerging markets, um, some of the less developed countries, one or two which I mentioned here, tend to have tend to have a fairly low currency, right? They tend to have relatively high interest rates on their government debt and corporate debt, okay? Because there's always the risk that, you know, they're not going to emerge and uh, you know, there may well be bankruptcies. You know, you put your money into companies in some of these uh, countries and uh, there's always the risk you're not going to get the money back. And, of course, that's what interest rates are all about. They, uh, they, they provide an income and they provide a premium against the full against the possibility of a default. And um, consequently, their currencies tend to be pretty weak as a result. Okay. Then, what we find is that particularly US funds are chasing this yield, and they see that in Turkey they can get yields of 10-15% 
maybe more with um, some company debts that they can they can uh, they can uh, buy their sort of debentures or their bonds, and they're going to be very very happy. And the result of that then is that this money will flow into those countries. And what happens? Well, it's a great boost for the country while it lasts. And it's going to have an immediate effect on their currencies. So their currencies harden. Okay? Their currencies increase in value. And again, you know, there are those who, who really like that. The only problem is that as their currencies increase, then all of those effects that we were looking at earlier on are going to have a negative effect. And they're going to have an effect to make their exports as competitive, etc. So <laughs> you then get this whole series of unintended consequences of QE, which start to turn upside down a number of these emerging, emerging markets. So the yield which is being chased by these U.S. funds, you know, it's great for them for a while. For a while. But as we've just seen recently, when rates start rising, exactly the opposite will happen. And what we've seen, this is a chart of the sort of very closely watched 10 year US bond yield, there we are, Bloomberg chart, and what we can see is that they've more or less doubled. Now, there we were at a low in May at around about one and a half, one point five percent. And there we are just hovering now under the three mark. So it's almost doubled, almost, almost doubled. And of course, that's what um, has put the bond market into a real tailspin. We found then that as yields rise, then bonds just do exactly the opposite. They're, they're joined at the hip with bonds and yields as um, is the way in which they sort of issue bonds so that if the interest rate increases or the yield on debt increases, then the bond that was bought will actually drop in value and it will drop it, it and it, they're joined at it. So it, it's, uh, they, they move in lockstep opposite to each other. So what we've seen, if you go and look at a bond chart, I should have actually put a bond chart on here. What you will see, in fact, well, we'll look at a bond chart in a minute, is that as this has been rising since May, then the bonds have just been falling. Okay. So bond investors are dead worried. They're dead worried that interest rates will keep rising. Because a tremendous number of of people, institutions, governments, local authorities will put their money into government bonds because traditionally it's seen as a safe haven. And what we've then seen is that those bond investors are getting really, really quite worried. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Philip. I think you're right. I think you're right. Now, Rocco, I, I don't know if that sort of helped to explain that a wee bit more of the correlation between um, bonds, yields, and also um, and also currency rates. So what we um, what we'll find is that since this has been going up, we've actually found that the U.S. dollar has actually been getting a bit stronger, and of course is chasing yield. So as the yield goes up, then the bonds attached to them will fall in value. And the currency that they're priced in will tend to rise in value. So, and that's, that's sort of more or less how, how it actually, how it actually works. So let's just look at the effects then on these emerging markets. Now there's this very nice little graphic which came from Market Watch. We kind of to produce this. And let's just look at it. So we're considering 
what actually happened in, in India recently, and Indonesia, and, and, and so on. Let's just look at this. Number one, yields start to push higher. That's what we've just been looking at over the last few months. The net result of that is that those investors who are chasing yield will pull their money out of the emerging markets. Okay. And consequently, out of the currencies of those emerging markets and their bonds as the hunt for yield subsides. So what then happens is that the emerging market bonds reduce and they find that their currencies will start to collapse. And particularly those countries which are not in a particularly sound position where investors might fear their ability to finance their current account deficits, they're going to get the brunt of the sell-off. Now, a lot of those emerging market um, countries are actually in quite a sound position. You know, they haven't got massive amounts of external debt. And so, you know, they'll probably weather the storm reasonably well. So let's just move on round to number three. So as the emerging market currency weaken, their central banks want to intervene, meaning that they want to try and prop up their currency. How does a country prop up its currency? Well, they've either got to increase interest rates, which is then going to be a drag on their own economies, and those companies that have borrowed money are going to find it more difficult to borrow money, etc., to keep their production processes going, or they actually intervene directly in the markets and they buy their own currency. But, of course, that will just draw down their reserves. Let's move up to number four. Foreign central banks, okay, could start to accelerate the selling of U.S. treasuries as reserve decline. So these foreign <coughs> central banks will hold an awful lot of their reserves in U.S. treasuries, U.S. treasury bonds. <clears throat> and they may well have to sell a whole load of those in order to use that money to try and boost their own currency, which has been collapsing because the money is being yanked out of their own country. So that's what they do. Those foreign central banks sell then to position themselves against these high interest rates moving on up. And it's a cumulative effect. It just goes round and round, ever faster, ever faster. And that's one of the reasons why we've seen India, India's um, currency collapse in, uh, in recent weeks. So there we are. The general emerging markets, whilst the U.S., had to indulge in QE in order to keep their own banks and consequently domestic economy ticking along without collapsing has resulted in some big, big, big problems in those emerging countries. Right, yeah, good, good, good point there. Good point, uh, Rocco. If yields rise, so does the currency. But, of course, it's not just about yield. There's always the worry, there's always the worry that an economy will just not be able to survive and pay its way. And if that does happen, then the entire economy starts to become suspect. Their manufacturing industry starts to tail off. If those yields start to rise, as we've seen with uh, the U.S. dollar rising, then one of the problems is that, you know, why would you want to keep your money in U.S. dollars? Well, because you're getting a really good, good yield. But one of the reasons why you might want to be a little bit concerned is the ability of the country to actually pay your money back. So if you put in your 100 grand, a couple of million, 100 million or whatever it is, into U.S. treasuries, 
there's always got to be a concern that you may not get your money back. Now, the US dollar is the world currency. It is, it is strong because we all use it to buy oil particularly, and it's used as the medium of exchange throughout the world. And all the other currencies are only used marginally for general transactions throughout the world. The US dollar is king. And whilst that remains the case, then if we put our sort of million into US bonds, you know, we're pretty well guaranteed we're going to get it back. However, contrast that with what happened in Cyprus recently, where they ended up in a bit of a crisis situation. And it wasn't so much about what the yield is on the money that is invested. There started to become big question marks about getting their money back. And that was well and truly founded because a lot of people did not get all of their money back that they'd invested in Cyprus. And so that's the real big concern. And that seems to be what? Yeah, ab- absolutely. Yeah, yeah. The more exotic the currency, the bigger the gamble. So, you know, you wouldn't describe the US dollar as an exotic currency, but at some point they will get to a level of indebtedness where they find it really, really difficult to actually pay the interest on that debt. Now, we've seen interest rates increase, and the chart that we're looking at is the amount of debt that there is. And in fact, it's moved up above the 6.7 trillion since that was put in May. It's, it's just hovering on the 17 trillion at the moment. But at some point, the bond market will say, are we actually going to get our money back out of the US? And just consider this for a moment. Just consider this. Throughout the world, oil is priced in dollars. Okay. There's a little bit of sort of euro stuff going on. There's a little bit of swap going on with the likes of Russia, Iran, and China. And prior to the Iraqi invasion, quite a lot of their oil, quite a lot of it was actually priced in euros. And what actually happened as a result one of the results of the Iraqi invasion is that all of their exports of oil exclusively are now priced in US dollars. And that's one of the main reasons why we're getting all of this turmoil in the Middle East. The petrodollar has to be preserved. If it isn't, and if oil is no longer priced in dollars, if it was priced in, in euros and you know, eventually all sorts of other currencies, then the value of the dollar will plummet. So that's one to ponder just for a moment. Anyway, let's just consider US debt, which is going up and up and up. And the question I'm going to leave you with on this is, will QE continue? Now, you may remember that last year we get these debt limits. You know, there are debt limits which have been set. There we are. Budget Control Act of 2011 increased the debt limit by 2.1 trillion to 6.4, 16.4 trillion, okay, through 2012. And there we are. President Congress suspended the debt limit from February 4th this year through to May the 18th, adding 300 billion in debt in less than four months. The next crunch time is going to come in October. <laughs> and in October, they will be hitting their next debt limit. <laughs> and that's when there'll be yet another crunch. So what's going to happen with QE? Are we going to find that there will be no more QE? And consequently, the debt limit will not be allowed to increase and there will have to be U.S. government cuts. Can you actually see that happening? (laughs) I find it difficult. And 
I guess that what we will find is that this little temporary tapering suggestion, is it going to happen? Right. Well, this is the debt clock I'm going to leave you with. This is a good one to look at. If ever you're, <laughs> if ever you want to feel slightly depressed, go look at this, us.debtclock.org. In fact, they've got one that runs throughout the world. And you can, you can see the amount of, um, for us UK people, just look at the, um, amount of UK external debt. It's the largest in the world. So the UK, got to keep the economy bubbling. They've got to keep importing people. They've got to keep building houses. And they've got to do everything to try and keep the economy bubbling. And we'll move on to the currency in just a minute. So look at that. That's where this was about half an hour ago, just hovering under the 17 billion mark. Right, guys. Well, (laughs) my intention wasn't to depress you totally this morning. But I get the impression that um, I've certainly left one or two little questions to be thought about. So let's go and let's go and take a look at what is actually going on in the markets. Hi, guys. I've I've just um, I just switched over. Can you can you actually see this? All right. Can you see a chart of the uh, Japanese yen? Or do I just need to refresh it? Brilliant. Yeah, you've got it. You've got it. Right. Well, let's look at the yen. This is a daily chart. Let's run this out for weekly. Gets just a tad more interesting then. What we've got is a weekly chart then of the Japanese yen. And I'm just putting a line across, a couple of lines across. And what we've got, excellent, yeah, all good, is a little triangle. And just this week, today, we've seen the price pop up above. And it looks as if we could be on for a resolution of this triangle. And it looks very much as if it wants to resolve its way on the upside. Yeah, you know, you can look at it in several different ways. You can call it a flat and a triangle, wave four, etc. And we've just got to wait to see if this is going to get resolved on the upside. Now, of course, Japanese have got all sorts of problems, not least of all, they've got that slight problem with um, a little bit of um, the Fukushima reactor, which uh, still seems to be reacting and will keep reacting, and that's causing them all sorts of problems. Um, and they've got um, the main structural problem that they have which is that their economy, despite what they do, is just not going to grow. And it looks very much as if we could well find substantially higher levels of the US dollar against the Japanese yen. Now, that may or may not happen. We've also got to be a little bit concerned with the amount of open interest that there is um, in this whole series of contracts is really incredibly high. So, you know, there could well be one or two changes there. But let's now just go and take a look at firstly the euro, and then we'll look at the pound, and indeed anything else you might want to just take a little glance at. But let's just look at the weekly chart then of the euro to start with. Now, if we just move that little line up there and this one up, we've effectively got the euro trapped between 134 and 128, and it's been there now for, you know, most of this year, most of this year, will break out of here eventually, eventually. But what it's proved to be is a very, very good range play. So by just looking at those highs and the lows and then bringing this down to a daily chart, what we can actually see is that whenever it's at the lows, we want to buy it. Whenever it's at the highs, we want to sell it. Brilliant range play. And we've had some excellent signals right the way on down here. There we are. Have one in April. I sort of moved up. Didn't get all that far. Came on back down. Formed one of these wonderful bat patterns, these harmonic patterns that I like to trade whenever I see them. And we got a brilliant run up right the way up to target up to 34. What did it do? It then just came down in short order. So we got a nice trend on the way up. 
Nice trend on the way down. And then we've had this one on the way up. Where is it going to go now? Well, <laughs> absolutely. Those bats are awesome creatures. And what we've now clearly see is that the uptrend has been broken and price is starting to move on down. It's found a little bit of support. We've got a support section area just down here and it's finding a little bit of support right now. It may well need to bounce back a little bit so that it can eventually form the required number of waves to get it right the way on back down below 130, 129, 128. Whilst there is the saber rattling going on in the States over Syria, of which the uh, sting has been taken out of that one just with the weekend events. But whilst that is still bubbling along, then the US dollar is highly likely to put in the odd major spike. And I guess that what we'll find is that um, there is a gap up here around about this 8350-ish level on the dollar index that needs to be filled. So that one would appear to be highly likely as a general response to what we'll see. All right, okay, yeah, let's just, just switch this back to the weekly chart. No question in there. And, um, yeah, you know, what we've actually got here on the, uh, on the dollar index is that We've got a base that appears to have been formed around about that 81. It's in the region of a previous base, and it keeps an uptrend intact by having a succession of higher lows. So we've got a low in early 13. Okay, We've then got this low, which came through there, and uh, that was in, in, um, in the end of May, June. Then we've got the recent low, okay, which did not drop below any of those lows. So we've got the uptrend intact for the moment, for the moment, for the moment. Crabs and bats, they're, they're quite distinct. They have distinct differences to them. And uh, crabs run to an 88.7 and um, gartleys run to 78.6. That is the distinction between them. Right. OK. Now, we took a little look at the euro just now. Let's just look at what is going on with the British pound. Ah, right, we've got a discussion going on now about the finer points of bats and crabs. Bats and crabs are very, very different. <laughs> I would differ with you there. I would say that they have great similarities, but bats are more powerful than crabs. Don't we have no ratio? Hmm. Well, yeah, I mean, dear old H.M. Gartley, um, there was a lot of work done beyond H.M. Gartley. And um, I think Larry Pasavento was possibly in Scott Carney. They, they actually took, um, took, took his work a lot, lot further and brought in the ratio. And, of course, where you've got the majority of participants looking at ratios, then you, 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 you really want to be aware of that. Without that, it can cause all sorts of problems. Anyway, let's just look at the um, chart that we've got over here on the weekly chart of cable. Now, there are similarities to what we've been looking at. In that, what we've got, let me move these lines, we've got lows just right the way down here at around about 48. And um, getting on for 900 pips higher, then we've got a top. So effectively, we've got a range. And that range has, has been formed now because we've got a, we've, we've got a, a very clear double bottom and we've got a very clear double top at the moment, at the moment. And we've seen then price move back away from these previous highs. Isn't that so often the case? Previous highs, previous lows are areas of reaction. And we've had price then pop down, but is attempting to rally. We bring this down to the daily chart. 
then we can see that top that much more clearly how prices moved on down. But candle action, candle action on these days. Just look at candle action. We've got candles with long wicks or tails, lower candles. And they are bullish candles showing that the momentum on the downside is drying up. And one of the most important levels is this one. Right there. Look at that. Double bottom has not broken that low. When that low breaks, then this previous uptrend can be said to have turned into a downtrend. It hasn't happened yet. But we've got this little rally on up. It may need to rally somewhat further in waiting for this rally because what that will mean is that when it turns, then we've got a really good selling opportunity. Looking at this on a four-hour chart, then we've got a low, we've got a little zigzag, and it looks as if it just might, it just might want to go a little bit higher, but it's now hit one of those important levels, 61.8. I would much prefer this to go on up to either hit the dark the or back level. But at some point, what it's going to do, it's going to do this. It's going to break that yellow line. It's going to break this other yellow line. And it's going to head on further south. And when it does, then we could get a fairly substantial move right the way on down. And that could be worth a good many hundred pips. Right, guys. Well, look, we've looked at uh, one or two of those major um, major charts. And I think before we leave this, we might just take a, a quick glance at the Australian dollar, because the Australian dollar has been getting really quite strong just recently. And let's just look at the pattern. Let's just look at the pattern. On the daily chart, we have price then moved down in this substantial run. Down, 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 down. It appeared to be setting itself up with a neckline. But then price went lower, bounced back, and then it didn't go lower. In fact, you can probably just about see that. My fib finder is telling me that that's at a bat level. At the bat level. Okay. Now this is not as far as purists are concerned, a proper bat pattern. It doesn't follow all the right ratios. But it's hit the level. And price action is suggesting that there will be, at the very, very least, a temporary move up. And that's what we've actually seen. Look at that. We've got a whole series of levels here. And we've now actually had an ABC move and as we can see, that has come to an end this morning at a bat level. And one wonders now if there is going to be enough power to push this one through for another substantial move. For my money at the moment, I would suggest that possibly we've had a good bit of a bounce completed. But we may well find the, the Australian dollar, as talk from China, is suggesting that things are possibly stabilising somewhat, things may not be quite so bad. Right. OK, guys. Well, um, that's time's up right now. And um, Oh, right, yeah, in fact, this is really quite interesting, actually. Yeah, well, thanks for that, David. David, Dylan. Um, reverse horn, yeah, okay. Do you consider double bottom still valid for back? Right, okay, I mean, what is really quite interesting there, um, uh, DV, is that 
we will very often see a pattern and we can relate it to either a double bottom, double top. And sometimes we can relate it to one of the perfect harmonic patterns. But we can only relate it to it. And it's never perfect. Or sometimes they're absolutely perfect and they just never work out. Sometimes those that we can relate it to and they're not absolutely spot on, sometimes they follow through beautifully. So I think that as traders, we've got to be really, really careful. And that is not to become, um, how can I put it, sort of one-track minded. We, we, we don't want to become, certainly in my experience, I don't want to become a purist. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, reasonable point, reasonable point. Absolutely, trade what you see. And um, we've got to be flexible. We've got to be, we, we, we've got to have a mindset that will allow us to just sort of see something which is price which is moving on and is obviously moving on. But because it doesn't come out of a pure pattern, we don't trade it. Well, you know, that would be crazy. The ultimate arbiter is price action itself. Price action itself. Yeah. Anyway, many thanks, um, Dee Vent, for, for that little sort of slightly technical discussion, if you like, on, on harmonic. But, uh, we're clearly like minded on this. And, um, yeah. <laughs> and in fact, um, uh, Richard, who, um, is a, well, a student of mine, has completed the various harmonic courses and wondering if he's, uh, if he didn't, has actually, uh, looked at any of my courses. However, there we are. Um, guys, it's been really good to be with you this morning. A, a very useful discussion and many thanks for your excellent, um, comments and questions, uh, coming through. And I hope that I've given you just a little bit of, uh, food for thought on, um, on that bigger, fundamental economic picture. Don't get too depressed. See you next month, guys. All the best for now.